Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to our second talk in science of 2021. If you joined us in January, you may remember my name is Wendy and I work in the public engagement team at Darsby Laboratory and we work for the Science and Technology Facilities Council or STFC. Darsby Laboratory is based in Cheshire and is one of three national STFC laboratories. The other two are located in Edinburgh and Oxfordshire. So who is STFC? Well, STFC is one of Europe's largest research organisations. We enable the UK's natural sciences, together with the computing and engineering communities, to carry out their world-leading research. And we do this by working with universities, national laboratories like ourselves, regional campuses and scientific facilities right across the UK and abroad internationally. We study a whole range of science from the smallest particles that we know of right through to objects in outer space and the mysteries of our universe. But tonight you'll be finding out about a whole other side to the work that we do in underpinning the support for the UK's businesses. So you don't need to go into outer space to see the impact that STFC has. As you're no doubt aware, we cannot see or hear you, but we have a questions and answer button at the bottom of your screen and you can type your questions in there. And don't be shy because we love audience participation. The more questions we have, the better. And no question is a stupid question. We aim to finish at seven o'clock. And if we don't get round to all of your questions, we will make sure we answer and record them for viewing afterwards. Tonight, we have three speakers and I'm sure you're eager to get going with the talk. So I will hand you over now to Luke, Phil and Aaron Allen to introduce themselves. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm, my name is Luke and I'll be uh, leading you off uh, for tonight. Um, so I think uh, my colleague will be sharing the slides uh, in a second, but welcome and thank you uh, for inviting us all along. Um, the overall aim of this kind of discussion, this this talk that we really do encourage you to kind of get involved with and, and, and make your comments on is, is looking at that commercialization of, of science and, and what we do to help people um, create businesses, create enterprise, um, and, and what role SDFC plays in that journey. Um, so, so yeah, the three of us will be talking about different kind of elements of that journey. Um, as I say, I'll be starting you off. So could you share the slides, please, um, Alan? Thank you very much. So if it's all right with my other two speakers, we'll kind of do introductions as we go along. I presume that's that's OK. I'm not I'm not presuming anything. There. Excellent. Good. It's all going well so far. If you could skip on to the next slide, please. Um, so my name is Luke, um, that is me uh, at a digital manufacturing conference, <coughs> I'm presenting to four chairs and an audience as well. Um, I'm 26, I actually did tropical diseases at um, university, so uh, that was at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. I had a fabulous time learning about all the sort of things you get in places like Africa and Southeast Asia from, from mosquitoes or even snails. Um, but I moved from that into business development for scientific organisations, which is how I landed in SDFC. Um, I like Scotland, um, which will become apparent in a minute. And as you can see from the fact I'm doing it now, I like talking a lot. So, um, you know, face to face interactions, that, that's me all over. Um, and on the other side, I dislike Zoom fatigue and I'd be shocked if anyone here wouldn't agree with that. And I hope this won't be a case of it. I hope this will be exciting and interesting for you all. Um, if you could move then to the next one, please. So who is it we work for? Um, so we work for the Business and Innovation Directorate for SDFC. Um, there's a picture of us all, um, and you can clearly tell this picture uh, is dated to a couple of years ago because there's a large number of us um, not abiding by two metre social distancing rules. That was at one of our uh, conferences uh, a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of people in the team, as you can see, uh, and we help small and larger businesses access a number of things that you might need in a, in a technology business. So um, technical expertise to understand um, new innovation, new, new, new technologies that can help you. Um, you might need large scale facilities. There's a lot of stuff that SDFC owns that not everyone can afford and then that's to be expected. So SDFC um, owns it and, uh, and we work with businesses to make sure they can access this if it's really gonna drive on what they're doing. Um, and then on some cases funding, we've got loads of excellent partners we work with in delivering and these include people like the European Space Agency um, and uh, Alan and Phil will tell you a little bit more about that side of things, but also um, the CERN 
Collider uh, in Switzerland as well. And these are just some of the exciting things that we, we see and, and we learn from. Um, and it's really about bringing this interest into businesses who grow uh, and employ people and, 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 and make interesting things and bring societal value. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. If you could move on to the next slide, please, Alan. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about where, uh, well, where I will be anyway. Um, at the moment, I work for Edinburgh. I work in Edinburgh at the Higgs Centre for Innovation, which is one of SDFC's sites. Um, as you can see, it's just south, south of the city centre. Um, and my current role is to help companies access hardware testing for satellites. Now that's really exciting to me. Um, you know, it's things like vibrating them to see if they break and checking they can go to really cool temperatures, which you often have to experience in space, and really trying to help people understand how to use these and, and access them and, and make sure they're compliant and that things won't just fall off when they launch. Um, and that's something I've only been doing for three weeks, so you have to forgive if I'm a little bit uh, little bit unsure quite what I'm doing yet, but, um, but I've really enjoyed that. And I think I'd just like to highlight that even though I started with tropical disease, I've moved on to something that's, that's quite different, but it's a very enjoyable path. And what's united the whole thing has been passion for science. Um, up until three weeks ago, I actually worked in Darsbury, which is on the next slide, if you wouldn't mind, Alan, um, that Wendy showed you earlier. So for anyone who's not kind of familiar with the area, uh, it's situated sort of equidistant-ish between Liverpool and Manchester. Here's the site uh, and some of the buildings. Obviously, you can see the tower, um, which, SDS, uh, which Darsbury is very well known for. Um, and there's loads of interesting facilities that the that, that STFC um, operates here and that BID help companies access. Um, if you could move on to the next slide, to give you a flavour for some of the technologies um, that SDFC work with, and indeed that we personally have uh, you know, access to in Darsbury. The first one I've noticed is supercomputing capacity. So um, you know, think your kind of commercial laptop and times it by a very, very large number, and that's what gets you a supercomputer. Um, for things like, you may have heard word like artificial intelligence and, and helping computers become more intelligent and make better predictions of things, you know, all sorts of things like weather patterns or, or travel. Um, this is the sort of thing that we help companies access. And, and obviously a supercomputer is very big, it's very expensive. Imagine trying to buy a, a large number of laptops, not everyone can do that. But fortunately, um, we'd be able to provide access to this building and hopefully push forward science in the meantime. Um, on the right of that, you see an example of 3D printing, where there's a particular uh, core capability in Darsbury, and that can be printing from plastics that we're all quite familiar with, to things in rubber, to things in a material called onyx, which has a similar strength to metal, but is much lighter, to carbon fiber that we all know well from Formula One, uh, to metals, which granted it's very, very small pieces of metal, but in principle, we can print in gold. And um, we haven't done it. We don't plan to do it. It's a very expensive thing, but it is still quite cool. Um, Bottom left, you see a particle accelerator, which uh, you know a lot of the core expertise at Darsbury was built around, um, and and really is is a lot of what the big science that happens with CERN and other facilities around the world really um, relies on. And bottom right is more one relevant, I suppose, to to our colleagues in Oxfordshire, um, but it's also it's lasers, and lasers are really cool, and there's loads of great commercial applications of them. So it's much further than, than just Star Wars and that sort of thing. There's loads of good stuff you can do. Um, I appreciate there might be some questions about that sort of stuff, and I will very happily get around to that um, towards the end. Uh, of, of my kind of section. But just to move on to the next slide, we're actually gonna uh, go on to a quiz. So if you could go one more for me, please, Alan. Um, no, we're gonna go for one more again. I'll try my best. And once more, there we go. So I'm now going to launch a port poll for you all. So you should have the question in front of you. And the question is, what is this app? So what, what is it doing? Um, SDFC has helped companies work on it. I'm assuming it's working. I've got two two votes in so far, um, which is really good. I hope a couple more. Will come. They're flooding in now. That's great. Interesting. There's, I'm going to give it another sort of five seconds or so. So, uh, so get your answer in while you can. I feel like Chris Tarrant all of a sudden. So I ask the audience. Right. I'm going to end it there. Um, the majority of you seem to have got this one right. So this was an app created to look at finding how busy your local supermarket is. So that might have seemed fairly uh, you know, unimportant recently, but for things like social distancing, this was critical. 
Um, and um, yeah, so, so, so to ensure that you go to the right supermarket um, and, and that indeed you uh, don't, don't, don't kind of crash into people, where's the best place to go? How long am I gonna wait? This app was vital. How did SDFC help? Well, we helped provide satellite data that allowed them to make these predictions. Um, and you know geolocation data um, and if I go any further on that I'm going to get it wrong so I'm going to leave that sort of discussion to Alan later he'll talk a little bit more about the fascinating stuff with satellites so on to the next one please Alan and one more please there we are so what is this what does it do I'm assuming if we don't know, Luke, we can just guess, really. Uh, yes, no, please feel free to guess. I'm, I, I don't know myself, Wendy. I'm hoping the answers tell me. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, there, there are right and wrong answers, but, um, but equally it doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong either. So another five seconds or so. So again, most of you seem to have got this, uh, this one right. Um, it's, it's for measuring uh, blood sugar levels, which is very difficult. Normally these things require um, pricks in, in, in a skin, you know, to take a little bit of blood to do. Uh, and this is really important for people with diabetes, of course. Well, if you have something that can continuously monitor it or, or indeed take readings through sweat in this instance, um, it's a much simpler way of monitoring diabetes and does really improve things. Again, how did SDFC help with this? Well, that's a 3D printed device. So I was talking about 3D printing in rubbers before. The actual casing around the outside was 3D printed. So we'll move on to the, the next one, please, uh, Alan. So what is this box? Feel free to to, have, to make your best guess, uh, as I say. Looks to me like it makes ice. <laughs> I told you that quietly, Wendy. You're not meant to give it away. It's a trick question. Th this one's dividing the audience. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to give it another few seconds, see, uh, see if we get one or another pu pulling away. And I'm going to end it there. We, we have a winner. We have Creates Unique Perfume Fragrances. Um, it's an interesting, interesting one. I'm afraid it's not right on this occasion. Uh, anyone who's put Creates Makeup that matches a person's skin tone was correct. Um, and so this was a company called Trigenix. Um, and, and what they've done is develop a device and issues art and intelligence to match match cosmetic tones up and this is just better for a array of reasons better for the consumer it's better for the, the shop selling it um, and it's a quick and simple process that uses things like sensors and and, and scanning and and, and and kind of chemicals uh, well, not, well not so harmful chemicals it involves the mixing of safe chemicals um, and, and, and things to make sure it doesn't irritate skin so um yeah really interesting device and something we don't often see in, in Darsbury but but it's great to to see something you know using technology in such an interesting way. So on to question four, please. Uh, and I'm sure you know what to, there we go, fantastic. So what's this, what's this thing? What does this system do? We're looking at the system on the screen there, just to, to be clear, not the presenter itself. So what, what's that thing doing? I think this one's caused a little bit of confusion. There was a, a slow start to it, but they're flooding, they're flooding in now. Yeah, we've got a runaway winner going on here. I wonder we, if it's we do, right have a winner. we do have a winner. So I'm going to end it there. That was 30 seconds. Sharing those, right? So for the first time, we actually have the, the lowest answer was correct. So any of you who put monitor people who work alone in their jobs, uh, you would be accurate. Um, this again was a great use of satellite data to ensure things like, you know, healthcare workers working alone, you know, don't get stranded or in trouble. Um, and, and, and also to kind of map the, the best routes to their directions and stuff. So, so monitoring business roads, that's very much something that satellites capable of. And, and this took it a few steps further to ensure the safety um, of healthcare workers. So again, I think this is something Phil will touch on in more detail about health technologies and applying those, but, but this is a really cool way to, to, to really try and help that. So thank you very much, Alan. So question 
uh, five on this one. This is the last one. So uh, yeah, you'll, you'll be free to, to have a, a time off the poly in a second, but what is this device? They're coming in quick this time. So I'll give it another few few seconds. I apologize, I may have got a little bit quick ears, but I hope uh, you'll get a chance to, to see it in a second. I'll, I'll give it a second before sharing the results. Uh, if you've had a chance to see it now, uh, what was this? Was it a small satellite, uh, a smart battery, or a drone. Um, so I'll share those now. It, it seems like most of you got this one. It was a small satellite or is a small satellite. And this highlights some of the exciting work uh, that people would do across the country and in Oxfordshire and Edinburgh around testing satellites. And, and this shows the progress that, that we help kind of businesses grow with. So, you know, satellites traditionally have been things the size of buses, double decker buses. Um, this is much smaller. It's, you know, they're called CubeSats or, or NanoSats, and they're usually about um, you know, say a meter squared or meter cube, sorry. Um, so really, really small. We're talking about devices you can hold in your hand and, and they can do some of the same jobs that, you know, the big satellites that we, we, we launched years ago can do. So um, yeah, I hope that's a good kind of quick whistle stop tour into some of the interesting businesses we, we've worked with. Um, in terms of applying that in Darsbury, if you could just move on to the next slide, please, Alan. I just wanted to highlight a company that works in health technology and, and how we help them to contextualize this. So um, this is a company called NGPod. Um, they made a device or have made a device that's all about um, ensuring nasogastric tubes that feed people in hospital are placed correctly. Because if that's not done, then it's what's in the NHS called a nether event, i.e. it never should happen. And yet every so often it does. And it's a very distressing but, but simple thing to solve. And unfortunately, this company have developed a device to do so. Um, so if you can move on to the next slide, please, Alan. Um, they started, uh, sorry, one more, please. Um, they started uh, with us in 2018. One more, please, Alan. And again, sorry, my bad. <laughs> There we go. Um, so they started us in 2018. We ran a competition to, to, to join us in some of our labs in Darsbury. We have both biotechnology and, and chemistry labs and, and they won a, a short package to gain access to labs and, uh, and, and get business support to help them move forward. Moving on from there, if you could move to the next slide, please, Alan. There we are. So they expanded in 2019 again, you know, mainly due to the great work of the company in, in accessing the NHS, but also um, from, from our side, providing that infrastructure and, and the network to try and to move that forward and, and highlight their, their, their excellent work. If you could move the slides forward once more, please, Alan. Uh, clinical trials started late last year. And if the final slide, please, uh, Alan, um, full scale production has happened this year. So that's a really good example of a company that we've worked together with that have taken their device from, from, from you know, slightly past conceptual stage from being an idea, but actually to full scale production and actually getting into people's hands um, and, and, and actually working and, and, and having societal impact and, and employing people. And, and we're obviously really proud to have worked with them. Um, if you could just skip onto the last slide, please, Alan. Um, why is this all important? Well. Just to highlight quickly, you know, an example, you know, we're currently obviously in a global pandemic and, and we've worked with a lot of companies who, who do all sorts of things um, relevant to that. You know, it might be as an example, providing the infrastructure and lab space to create COVID testing safe um, areas and, and make sure that's done in an effective manner. Um, it could be 3D printing of PPE that we heard a lot about last year and Darsbury got involved with, a, with, with some of that and ensuring that got out to the front lines of hospitals. Um, and it could be the use of artificial intelligence to find new molecules and, and, and combinations of, of drugs that can help you know, tackle infectious disease. But I don't want to go too much further because I think Phil is the, the resident um, health technology expert and I won't be doing it justice. So I'll quickly try and touch on a couple of questions if that's all right, Wendy, and, and then move on to Phil, or would you like me to move straight over? That's absolutely fine. I think we're bang on for time. So we've got three questions coming there, Luke. Um, okay. The first one's from Kieran. Um, question to everyone, really. What is your favourite piece of technology that you've come across at STFC? 
Well, I'll answer that one for now. And then if Alan and Phil, do you want to, if you touch on it during yours, would that, would that be okay? Excellent. So, so my personal, uh, personal interest is, 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 is I do like the, the 3D printing. I think the, the carbon fiber stuff is particularly cool. The idea you can make something so strong. I'm using a fairly kind of basic technology. And I think a lot of us know about these desktop 3D printers, but the much bigger ones that we have access to are, are really exciting. Um, but I'd also highlight as well um, some of the, the work we do in virtual reality and the, the virtualization of things. And we, we all know about gaming engines, but they can also be applied away from PlayStations and Xboxes to, to commercial aspects as well into headsets. So I like that one too. Right. Okay. Elizabeth is asking, it would be interesting to know how well used or popular these devices are in the general population, or are they in the general population? Uh, 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 do, do you know which devices specifically, or or or? If, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't say. But actually, are any of these devices out there? Are they mainly in in the businesses and in the organisations? So, so if we talk about the NG Pod as an example, that's something that's oh the, the diabetes it's one. Um, not <laughs> thank you very much. I mean, it's not been rolled out to, to huge extent, but there's there's kind of a lot of processes a medical technology device has to go through for this. And the other thing is there's lots of kind of different bits that that can treat something like diabetes. So uh, I'd have to follow that one up a little bit more to see how far out it's got. But certainly we do. You know, if I take the NG Pod as an example, that's being rolled out this year and will be in. We you know as I understand anyway it'll be in the hands of clinicians so um so yeah these two things do you know a key things of these um is to um is to make sure they do get into the hands of society rather than it being something you know that's that's really interesting but but the application isn't isn't always there so we, we do make sure that's that's important oh, fantastic and finally we've got kieran again who says how does stfc get hold of satellite data i, I might shirk away from one slightly just in case i go over half of alan's talk by accident so um i'll leave that one for later if that's all right kieran and, and pass over to phil if that's okay brilliant thank you Well, hi everyone, going absolutely ple uh, pleasure to be with you today and thank you for that introduction, Luke. Uh, so I'm Bill Carville going, uh, I'm 34, just share a few facts about me. Uh, I studied space physiology, so that's how the body changes in space. Um, and I know Alan will talk more about space a bit later on as well. Um, but also I, what my main job within STFC is to head up our regional health technology cluster. So in my talk later today, I'll be uh, telling you a little bit more about my scientific journey, what are clusters, why we do them, how that supports research, but also companies as well. And then going in some of the ways that we are working both with companies, but also researchers to support the health and life sciences sector before handing over to Alan. One of the questions uh, early in the chat window is what is my favorite uh, piece of SCFC technology or developments? And that's for, for me going, I think, the work that went into the Desri laboratory, construction of the synchrotron radiation source, the, Nin, the Nina particle accelerator, so that expertise of building a machines which accelerate particles at speed, that really helps to understand what's beneath the surface of materials, from health materials to chemicals to biological materials. It's just so fascinating. Um, and the iconic Dartry Tower, it was, uh, I remember when I took the job uh, at Daresbury at SCFC, it was just amazing to see that up close. Question in the chat window, um, and again, I haven't got a poll for this one, but uh, in the 1970s, when was the Daresbury Tower constructed and finished? So when was it finished? Does anyone know? I might have to ask my uh, panel team as well. So if you have a suggestion of when that was, just pop in the chat window now. Just give it a few seconds. Okay, so we've got a uh, few suggestions already. 971 going. Um, Wendy, do you know? I'm thinking, um, I think it was built in the 70s and operational in the 80s. I'm, I'm guessing. I should know, but... So in terms of, yeah, so built in the 70s, but the, tower was, the actual construction of the tower was finished in 1976. I hope I'm mm -hmm. correct on that one. But so much was done going forward as well. So in terms of building more particle accelerators and building that expertise over decades. So the, the side desk we had to be operating for a number of decades continues to push the boundaries on new particle acceleration techniques. 
every day. Um, so in terms of my likes as well, going, I love coffee, I love fitness, but one thing I don't like is the, is the home haircuts at home. So one thing I'm looking at that image there, I think going, gosh, going, I wish when I had hair. Alan, next slide, please. So can you give me four uh, nudges on the um, button to move the two things forward for me? Two, three, four, give me five, one more. Great, so I put up a number of images here. So my journey in science, I started looking, started with the degree in exercise science. Then I got really interested in how athletes adapted in extreme conditions. Then it was looking at space, so how the body changed in space. And then that led me to see how we can adapt humans to space or more importantly, what can we do to keep humans healthy in space? So if I had to drill that down into one thing, it's all about how the body changes in different situations, and that fascinates me. But to do that, we need to look at, uh, start using technology and other mechanisms to go beneath the surface. So one thing that I looked at when I was uh, studying space was how the spine changed in space, particularly going how, it ex how we got taller in space. So again, does anyone have a, have a little think, how tall, how much taller does someone get in space? So for context going, when you wake up, the morning, wake up in the morning, you are at your tallest. So you can be up to 1.5 to two centimeters taller the first moment you wake up in the morning. And then gradually throughout the day, you'll get a tiny bit shorter, again, by that 1.5 to two uh, centimeters. And that's due to gravity and that is fascinating. Now, one thing we can do to look into where that's happening is to use medical technology and that's medical imaging. So we use, uh, so in some of my research, I use uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And again, that's so we can go beneath the surface of the body and actually see the structures. Um, and that sort of imaging technology is used in STFC and different, different types of imagery to understand how structures change. Um, so this actually project I worked on going to space, I looked at how the spine changed with load. So when you look to push some load on the shoulders or the feet, and then also when you had no load, so when you were laying down. And this helped to design a suit for astronauts to wear in space, which flew on two occasions. So in the bottom right corner there, you can see the astronaut Andreas Morgensen, uh, Morgensen wearing the suit on the International Space Station, which is the largest, um, um, a laboratory ever created in space so far and particularly with the Mars rover landing last uh, couple of days ago I'm so excited to see again what new laboratories and scientific discoveries we have make over the next decades I'm sure a number of you in the call will be at the forefront of that one thing uh, a couple of things I'm really passionate about is public engagement and talking about quality diversion and inclusion and I've had careers throughout my uh, time in uh, in science from when I was at university all the way to now, and I've loved every job for different reasons. Alan, can you give me two more uh, clicks, please? So my question when I finished uh, uh, my uh, degree at university was going, how can I support research, innovation, and flourish? And that was, for me, going, I loved working in science and still do, but how could I do more? And for me, I was really interested in how businesses are working research, how research is funded, and how we can bring people together to create new innovation. So taking new ideas or putting the ideas in different situations. And that's what really motivated me. So Alan, Alan give me a click, please. Perfect. So that's what drove me to this job and this was cluster development. So what is a cluster? So clusters look to bring entities, so different organizations together around a particular sector. So within uh, our organization, SCFC, we have six clusters either launched or in development. So there are uh, six others of me. So around, so all of them have more hair. So uh, we started cluster development in 2010, so just over 10 years ago in the space sector, and we've grown this to health and energy in the Oxfordshire region. So developing clusters, so bringing people who are really passionate about those subjects together to share ideas around research, to bring businesses around, think how we take those research into potential products, but then also how we actually support new jobs, new research and new innovation in those areas. We've also taken this model about how we develop clusters now into Northwest. So I head up our health cluster up there and myself and Alan are actually working on a new project now to think of how could we build a Northwest space cluster? So where space can add value to this region. So Alan might touch on that a little bit later, but can we go to the next section again to think about clusters again? 
So one more click, Alan. So again, this is the Darnsby Laboratory, that iconic tower there. It's a national science innovation campus and it hosts that regional health cluster. The cluster is there to connect those capabilities, those organizations together. We do that to, around a central vision and empowering system health and well-being. Why do people set up health companies or develop health and life science research? Because they want to make a difference. They want to support the NHS with new innovations. They want to think, how can we develop new therapies or drugs? Or they want to think, how can we look to delve into topics going from infectious diseases to mental health, to occupational health, to workforce dynamics. There's a huge array which colors health and life sciences, and that is fascinating. There's also a lot of research that goes behind it. So who works in the cluster? Over 50 organizations. So Alan, can you go give me three taps? One, uh, one more. So again, that same slide before, and this slide here, you were then going, that is a lot of tiny writing. That is all the organizations we work with so far in the health tech cluster. Now, Alan, can you give me one more slide? So back to my Starbucks career, that reminds me going, when I, when I put this all down, who do we speak to? I thought, this looks like a coffee board. You know, when you walk into Starbucks or Costa, you go in and you think going, I just want a coffee or I just want this. And sometimes it is so helpful just to speak to someone who can point you in the right direction. And that's what we look to do in the cluster is sort of bring all that board together and then help to un help everyone in that coffee shop understand what it is. So when someone walks in, they can more intelligently signpost them to who they need to speak to. Alan, give me one more. Nope, that's me working in Starbucks. Go so again, <laughs> give me one more. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. You've got a company there and a national organization there. But this one, this was the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, Healthcare Excellence helping companies to understand going some about the standards that we have in place to create or develop new health technologies. So again, a great connection there, one of our conferences there. Alan, next slide. So very briefly, some of the things we've done over the last sort of a year or so, 1920, you think going, why do you do this? Well, we've supported new companies coming into the region. We've helped people build new collaborations, develop new research ideas, We've helped them go to uh, help to trade missions coming into the country to understand going what are the people they need to speak to. I also put on specific events as well around themes. A lot of people may be passionate about uh, digital health. So health, you know, potentially creating applications using the phone. It could be looking to do around healthy aging. So how we design products or services for the aging community or to empower people as they age. So what we tend to do is create focus areas and bring the people who are interested around, around that together. And again, one thing you've heard already is that I'm really passionate about where different sectors interact between space and health. So we've created certain groups and activities so those two sectors can meet and start to share more insights as to where the space sector could influence the health sector, where doing things in space can help. And again, I won't go into that too much detail because Alan may touch that on uh, in his slides, or we can take into Q&A. Next slide, Alan. Now, one uh, next couple of slides I'm just gonna go into is thinking some of the national laboratories. So again, the questions was, what is some of the favorite technologies I have with an STFC? And there are just so many, but how do these actually support new products or services or work with companies and researchers? So uh, Luke already mentioned the Hartree Center. So one of our key centers for Date, working with big data, so large data is coming either in big sizes, at fast speeds, or in different varieties of data. So when we talk about data, even if you talk about your phone going, it could be text data, so things you're just writing down. It could be numbers, so large amounts of numbers going, and it could be in very different settings as well. So how does that work on a health side? So Alan, give me the next slide, please. So this is a case study of how the Hartree Center, that national, one of the national centers that are working with big data and create, using, creating tools using artificial intelligence to actually understand data, work together with other organizations like IBM Watson and the Alder Hay Children's Hospital whole world, thinking how can we build something together whereas there needs to be value. So one of the uh, products that was developed here was building the Cognitive Hospital, the Alder Play app. So when people were coming into the hospital, they had a number of questions they wanted to ask either in advance or where they're in there. And it could be as simple as thinking, how do I park? Or 
how do I prepare for my appointment in hospital? Or where do I need to go when I arrive? So working together, they created this application to actually uh, put this in the hands of the patients or the people who are visiting the hospital. So they could download this app and then they could ask these questions in this chatbot. So ask Ollie. So this is one of the uh, uh, one of the brilliant innovations I've seen is how we can actually take data and actually create a solution which can help people ask questions about it in an actual setting. Alan, next slide. So this is one of the companies which is headquartered uh, at SciTech Dare Street, Walker, and this is CEO Liz Ashel Payne. Now, um, if, if you look on your phone, you've got so many apps on the phone, and if you like uh, like me as well, I quite like health apps. You know, but one of the questions you might ask yourself is going, if I've got a health app on my phone, well, who reviews that? Who knows if that app is secure? How who knows if that app is um, built in the right way, is considering a number of variables or what it's reporting on? And this is actually going, what uh, Orca and uh, as an organization has been doing is helping people to pick the right healthcare app using data science and expertise. So by um, reviewing apps in the app library or working with people who are developing app digital applications, they can help, to help them to develop them with confidence and answer some of those questions that people might have and actually review them all in a standardized way. So I think that's a brilliant project, which also um, we had the uh, some of the people in SFC had the pleasure of working them on this as to how we could take the expertise in data science, which SDFC has, and work with a company to improve the way they are already doing an excellent job. Just thinking about how we can make things better or more efficient. Next slide, Alan. So again, back to, that, back to the Daresbury Laboratory. So again, uh, one of the centers we have is called the Accelerator Science Technology Center. And this works both with um, academics, but also industry as well. So that tower was home to one piece of, uh, uh, to a piece of a number of equipment over a number of years, but the foundations, technology, and the shielding it had to actually house those accelerators is now being used by a company called Advanced Oncotherapy to develop the next generation of proton beam machines. And those machines are used, particularly uh, can be used in cancer beam, uh, in not cancer beam, uh, in cancer treatment. So if you um, know about the Christie Hospital in Manchester or the Claddagh Hospital in Liverpool going, and others around the UK going, these, um, uh, these centres require a large amount of building around them to house these instruments. So advanced oncotherapy is using the expertise it has and working, uh, in a, uh, working at the laboratory to understand how it can maybe make these things smaller and more efficient as well. So that's a great idea where you can collaborate with others to really take the learning, design and trial, new research and innovation, potentially for future products and services. Next slide, please. Um, so Luke already mentioned that uh, as well as going working with companies and technology, STFC at its sites also helps to um, house a number of equipments and services for them to develop uh, themselves. So next slide, please. And this is one of the companies there, Samantha Westgate, CEO of Effectus Biomed Group, started uh, developing the company in the, the laboratory space there in a flexible way. And she's now grown this to an international company. It's a fantastic CEO story. And this company has provides customized, serv uh, customized services so, but those developing, say, new dis disinfectants like you have at home to uh, sanitize a surface, to those creating new medical devices, they often work with other companies to actually understand going, how effective are they at doing what they say they're doing? And Perfectus Biomed Group has worked with a number of organizations developing things, developing COVID-19 products, for instance, for PPE uh, and protection equipment to skin sanitizers just to give them that more confidence that what they're doing is having an effect. So it's a great example there. Now I'm gonna go a little bit quicker in my last couple of slides there. So Alan, could you uh, fast forward to my next slide after this? So that was our Harbour site there, going home to over 200 organizations. And back to that question of what excites me in terms of research and structure, Harbour hosts a lot of this. So Alan, click one more time for me. There are so many uh, scientific facilities uh, based not only at Daresbury and also our sites in Scotland, in Northeast at Bowlbury, but also at Harwell as well. And all of these can be used in different sectors, from space to health 
to transport to energy going. And again, a lot of them actually help to understand what's beneath the surface that we can see. So Alan, if you can go two more points for me, please. And next slide. This is one of the facilities, so the neutron and muon source. And what this is doing is accelerating protons, protons going really fast, 84% speed of light, going which is around six times, which is around the Earth six times uh, in one second. And actually doing that, so it can actually uh, create uh, new part of, uh, to create new particles, which can go help us again go beneath the surface. So particularly with neutrons, what we might do here if we look at the hip. So we all got a hip, but sometimes when that hip needs upgrading with a replacement or implant, we want to understand how that implant works before it goes into someone. So understand maybe the stresses behind it to create the best sort of implant you can do. So uh, some of the work at the uh, laboratory there has actually looked to actually go beneath the surface and understand the different materials. So again, to just give that, uh, give that information to the designers of these hip replacement uh, hip implants as to going what they're made of and how maybe they could be designed or materials be utilized to optimize that. Alan, next slide. So I'm just gonna hand over to Alan now. So again, this is an example of in between space and health where space technology can be used to go into the health sector. And I think this is a great, a great way to go segue straight into Alan now to talk about a bit more about space. So Alan, over to you. Just while you're handing over there as well, Phil, um, there's somebody called Alan in the audience tonight. I think he may have worked at Dars, but he said the tower was constructed in only a few weeks thanks to a new fast shutter construction which is completely beyond me, but um, it sounds very interesting. It makes me wonder uh, how hard it would be to take the tower down, to be honest, because it looks quite a robust tower, doesn't it? Hopefully we don't need to ask that question for a long time. To, uh, <laughs> exactly. OK, over to you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. So uh, my name is Alan Cross. There we go. Um, I am 37. I am not from a science background. I uh, trained as an actor back in the day and had a little bit of success with it and then became a singer, which for many, many years I made a living. Still, I'm a singer, but segued into science because I was so interested in space and in developing space in the Northwest. So um, my job day to day is to help businesses understand space applications. That's the use of data from space. I don't mean about black holes and stuff. I mean positioning data from satellites and satellite communications um, and Earth observation imagery, this sort of stuff. And to help businesses understand how can they create new products and services around that and then funnel them into get some, uh, to getting some funding and support from the European Space Agency. Um, as Phil touched on then, I'm also the co-lead with Phil on developing the Northwest Space Strategy to develop a Northwest Space Cluster. My likes and dislikes are very childish. I like space and I like sweets. I also like dinosaurs and I do not like getting up early. Uh, but to make myself look a little bit more professional, I also say I don't like acronyms. I actually don't like acronyms. I really don't like acronyms. And this is full of them, so I apologise in advance. Moving on. So I'm going to talk a bit about space and the space industry. So it's very easy to just think space is about rockets and it's something that the Americans do or did many, many years ago. Um, but globally, space is big business. This is, you know, hundreds of billions of pounds. If you don't know, to count to a billion would take you almost 33 years. So it's a big number. Um, in terms of growth, the space industry is expected globally to reach over 700 billion pounds in 20 years and to be well over a trillion pounds in value by the middle of the century. Here in the UK, it's also big business. It's about 15 billion pounds worth. It's probably now closer to 20 billion. We'll know in the next few months when um, there's a report coming out called the Science and Health Survey. Now, as I said, it's not all about building rockets. Only in the UK, and this is actually accurate for the rest of the world, only about one third of the space industry is about building and operating rockets and spacecraft and, and the ground infrastructure and that. Now, um, I should point out that the billions and billions that's being spent is not necessarily all governments. This is by and large commercial operations. Um, but as you can see there, about two thirds is the downstream, which is what I mentioned. It's the use of the data from space. Um, for example, some of you may use Uber or Deliveroo. These are all services that are enabled 
by satellites. And you may not think, you may think, well, I just touch a button and it happens at that space. But when you touch a button on your phone and identify where you are, you're interfacing with billions of dollars worth of spaceships by doing that. So we use space every day, every single day. As you can see, the UK is committed to growing its share of the space sector. This is a high growth sector. We're quite good at it. We're good at the underpinning technologies and the UK wants to improve that. Now here in the Northwest, and I apologize to anyone tuning in who's not from Northwest England, I'm gonna focus broadly on that. We are the largest digital economy in the UK outside of London. We are the largest aerospace manufacturing hub in Europe. And yet we only generate half of 1% of the UK space sector. So you may ask, why are we looking at developing a space cluster in the Northwest? Currently, the space sector in the Northwest looks like this. There are about 75 organizations. As you can see, this is mostly a commercial operation. Um, now, the Northwest has a slightly different split. So unsurprisingly, you know, in the Northwest, we build stealth fighters and nuclear submarines and this kind of thing. So unsurprisingly, the upstream, the manufacturing and operation of space technology is about half of the space industry here uh, with the downstream applications following and midstream. So midstream would be someone who builds a piece of equipment that interacts with satellites and then they build a, a digital service surrounding that. So a little snapshot there. I won't stick this too long. So why look at the Northwest if it is apparently doing so little? Basically, when we're talking about space, we're talking about digital and we're talking about advanced manufacturing and we're talking about a situation that is growing rapidly. Look at the Northwest. What do we do? We do advanced manufacturing and we do digital. And so when you put it all together, space is a significant opportunity in the Northwest for businesses and academia to access untapped high growth, new markets and areas of research. And that is why STFC is focusing on the development of the Northwest space sector. A little snapshot now of who's doing what here. So Satisfy, they're based near Manchester airport. They build uh, components for satellites and spacecraft. They do chipset integration. They do uh, steerable, uh, electronically steerable antennas. So satellites not only talking to the ground, but talking to each other. If you've ever used the internet on an aeroplane, that will be using an electronically stable antenna from satellite. Very good chance Satisfy have some technology built into that if you've used it. DriverNet is based in St. Helens. These are using data from space, positioning data, and this is a health application. So very often the, um, the way that transport and the NHS coordinated isn't very efficient. An ambulance is booked because someone needs to use it at seven o'clock, but things run over and they're not going to use it till 11. So the ambulance just sits there and waits while your nan needs to get home and she could be taken. So this is about Uberizing that service, making sure that it's much more efficient. AWOL is based in Lancashire and um, they're a sports event photography company. Uh, they do expeditions up the Amazon stuff, but they do marathons. And if you've ever run a marathon or a race, anything like that, you'll know there's lots of people taking photographs and it takes a while for them to get online. Industry standard is 24 to 48 hours. We've worked with them to help them understand that they can use satellite communications and we helped fund that. And now they're the only company in the world that can do that in real time. And they've got the biggest players in the world knocking on their little door in Lancashire, asking them how on earth they did it. And there's also the Square Kilometre Array here in, in, the, in the Northwest. If you don't know what that is, when it's finished in 2030, it'll be the largest instrument ever built by humanity. It's, it, will, it will make the Large Hadron Collider look like spare change, like a, a, little, a, a little science project. It will be a series of radio telescopes that when linked together will stretch from Africa to Australia. It will form a single astronomical instrument the size of the Earth. Why have I mentioned it for the Northwest? Because global headquarters is right here. It's in Cheshire at John Drop Bank. They've got a SNAS new building with all flags outside, all sorts of stuff. It's a wonderful thing. So the Northwest Space Strategy, we're looking to increase the number of organizations doing space in the Northwest. This is who we're working with. All of the local enterprise partnerships in the region, national research councils, 
by the way, this is where the acronyms come in. Uh, the Northern Space Consortium, the Northwest Aerospace Alliance, all the necessary players are coming together because we've realized that the Northwest can do space and that it will be a great driver to generate lots of jobs in the Northwest. So STFC is leading on this project. We are mapping what's actually happened in the Northwest, trying to get an accurate picture of the space sector. We're going to analyze and see what our strengths are and how that relates to emerging trends in the space sector. We're going to create some actions. This, when this document comes out in April, it won't just be put in a cupboard and forgotten about. We're looking at identifying actions that can really make a difference here in the Northwest. And we all know how to work together across the region with our national partners and internationally to make sure there's sustainable economic growth and job creation. The future of that, we think, in the Northwest should be businesses and policy leaders and people like you understanding what the importance of space is. We want to be growing those industries and those research institutions into exciting new arenas to create more jobs that will be high value. We want to attract them, create them, retain them, everything. And we're going to provide leadership to provide that. So why we want to do this? What are we going to be part of in the coming years when we can increase the Northwest space share? launches well we're not going to be building or launching stuff in the northwest but the uk is getting involved in sending stuff to space you may have heard people say you can only launch from the equator that's true if you want an equatorial orbit but if you want to go to polar orbits lots of different orbits you can be anywhere in the world so here's the sites that were currently um, on the cart some of them are launched from aircraft some of them vertical launch for example Newquay down in cornwall this is going to be um, horizontal launch, you can see there they've signed a contract with Virgin Orbits. The thing looks like that. There's the rocket going up. In the north of Scotland, there's lots of different sites. We're not talking about building the Kennedy Space Center. We're talking small scale stuff like this. Not a great picture, but just gives you an idea of what's going on. We're talking small launches, low impact on the environment. Here's a great um, artist impression of what this launch will look like. The reason why we're looking, at, we're looking small and not big is because, and Luke touched on this earlier, Small satellites used to look like this. That used to be considered just a few years ago, a small satellite. Now, small satellites look like this. All that technology compressed down. And you might want to send one of these, you might want to send thousands of them to do a job. So there's an opportunity there as well, because of course, you've got data management, you've got, um, you've got problems with space debris how do you map these objects how do the objects communicate with each other the use of that data how you use that and manage that data is something the northwest is really good at so there's an opportunity there as well the uk is doing all sorts of space we're building the telecoms infrastructure on the moon we're building air breathing rocket engines that will take off and land like an aircraft we are we've signed the artemis accords which is about how commercial entities will use the moon and mars we're entering a new era in this and stfc is at the heart of helping the northwest unlock its potential on that as well as the potential of oxford and edinburgh where luke's gone this is a national body I'd like to speak now directly to the young people. If you're thinking about universities and apprenticeships and career options in your future, consider this. I am the impossibly old age from where you're standing of 37, or 38 in two weeks, if, if you're thinking of sending me a card. So what's gonna happen is I've got 30 years of my career ahead of me. I'm not even halfway through my career, right? And now for you, if you're a young person, you, old people like me will tell you that you've got the world at your feet, and it's true. But when you get to my age, not even halfway through your career, you will not have the world at your feet. You'll have three. In this decade, we are going back to the moon to stay, not like Apollo, to visit. Not like, like Shackleton going to the, 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 uh, the South Pole and coming back. And now we stay at the South Pole, we have research bases. That's what we're doing with the moon this decade. It's probably what we're gonna be doing on Mars as well. And it's gonna be integrated with commercial opportunities. So we will stay because like it or not, money makes the worlds go round. STFC is helping businesses to understand how they can do this. I'd say to you, if you're considering a career path, dream big, dream so big it frightened you. Uh, it will terrify the people around you, but it's important that you dream big because the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty and power of their dreams. You've been born at a time 
300,000 years humans have been around and you've just turned up at the exact time that we're about to laugh and reach out our hands amongst the stars. So it's important that you dream big and that you action it. Never be afraid to ask questions. Never ever be afraid to ask for help. And that's what STFC is here to do. And now I'll take any questions that we have. Well, that was quite inspiration that Alan. I would imagine a lot of schools would welcome you in to give inspirational talks to the students. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Uh, we've got time to take uh, questions, so please send them in to us through the Q&A button. Uh, we've got one here off mic. Um, many years ago, I attended a lecture by Professor Eric Laithwaite, the father of Maglev. He showed a clip from a then current children's sci-fi program called Fireball XL5, the ship being launched on a rocket sled. He said, give me a small plane and a medium mountain and my technology will get you into space without rockets. This was probably a boast, but the rail gun is now real. So how about a less noisy, repeatable and more environmentally friendly launch? The answer I would say to that is um, G-force. A, a rail gun, a, a rocket accelerates gradually because it's you can throttle it. A rail gun accelerates you instantly. Uh, several million Gs that would reduce you to liquid, frankly. Um, there, there is talk about mass drivers and whatnot on the moon. Of course, the problem is if you're going to accelerate something to orbital speed on the ground, there's a lot of air to push through and you'll melt. Um, so you have to get through the atmosphere and then accelerate. Uh, on the moon, where there is no atmosphere, you can accelerate as fast as you like on the ground. So it may well be that maglev will be used in that instance, I would think. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, can, I, can I quickly interrupt as well, Wendy, yeah, which course, is the yeah. point in the direction of a company called Skyrora, who um, I think that eco-consciousness is right at the forefront of their thinking um, and have developed a rocket fuel called EcoScene made out of recycled plastics and have many other socially important bits, but, but that's one bit that I'd recommend. So that was Skyrora. And, and also Sky, um, the Skylon I mentioned before with reaction engines, that is an air breathing rocket engine that starts off as a regular aircraft engine, becomes a rocket engine, flies up and down to space as a single unit and is powered by hydrogen. So the output of that is water and not mm. an awful lot of pollution from that. We're going to be hearing a lot more about hydrogen in the near future, I would imagine. Um, Joe is asking, hi, Alan, what degree will you take to get into the space industry if you were a young person? Um, anything science, um, science, technology, engineering, maths. Um, there's such a broad range of applications. You can do software engineering, you can do mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, um, pure mathematics, physics, astrophysics, whatever it is you want to do. As long as it's the easiest way in will be science, technology, engineering, it's maths. Um, I didn't do that, I was an actor and came into it that way. Uh, because I had a knowledge of what was happening in the Northwest and there's passion from that. But that would be, for, as you know, there's now um, the call open for astronauts from the UK. I can't do it. I don't have a master's in, 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 in STEM yet. Maybe I'll get one for the next time around. Mm -hmm. That would be my recommendation. Elizabeth is asking, are there other pathways rather than just going through a degree route? Oh yeah, absolutely. So apprenticeships, um, STFC does apprenticeships for uh, in a variety of different sectors. Uh, one of the conversations, we're, well, several of the conversations we're having in developing this Northwest space strategy is how can we work with in-work training, in-job training to get people, so apprenticeships, that sort of thing, to get people upskilled. There's lots of universities and colleges that do apprenticeships in the Northwest, you know, Bolton and University of Central Lancashire, helping them understand what the skills are for space and helping them work with industry to do that. Okay, fantastic. Um, we'll go back to Kieran's question right at the beginning. Um, how does STFC get hold of satellite data? Uh, the same way everyone else does. There is freely available data from ESA, from NASA, from the Japanese Space Agency. Um, the big public space agencies have freely available data. Um, if you want higher resolution, you can go to private companies um, like EarthEye. Uh, oh Lord, who else? But there's lots. There's lots of commercial ones. Um, if you want to drop me a message um, separately, I can point you in the right direction with that. But there's freely available and there's commercial data as well. SCFC doesn't own any of it. We can access it through different partners. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. 
One question that I've still got from the beginning, and Phil and Luke have already answered it, is what's your favourite piece of STFC technology? When I first started in this job, bear in mind, I went from being a jazz singer one week to ESA Business Applications Ambassador the next. I walked into Darsbury and there was a sign that said, workshop today with an arrow. Um, and it was a workshop for force fields. And my head fell off. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I presume it's something to do with particle physics. So that was exciting. But really in day to day, I'd say the heart tree center, the computing power on that, just shy of four petaflops for reference, what your laptop it can do in 10 minutes what it's going to take your laptop to do in 20 years it's a, it's an amazing piece of technology yeah it's quite phenomenal and you drive past these buildings and they just look like a suite of buildings don't they but you don't know what's going on inside which is really awesome we've got one final question here from um l gibson do you do any of the businesses have any plans specifically to support people with autism or other neurodiverse conditions that is a very good question, actually. Um, it, it, it's it's not uh, it's not a specific conversation I've had. I am very aware, though, that um, the recent call from the European Space Agency concerning astronauts has a specifically is exploring um, uh, neurodiverse people, people um, uh, perhaps with with uh, physical differences as well. So that's from my side. I, uh, with, with Luke and Phil, um, I don't know if they've got a response there. So there, are, um, so there are um, projects within some of the businesses going across our campuses, going which look at a wide variety of sort of uh, hum human uh, conditions. So particularly, uh, on Hawk already mentioned already. So in terms of going looking at what digital health applications, reviewing those, which could be a benefit to certain uh, conditions, as one thing they do. And there are some other com uh, companies as well. There are other campuses as well, creating uh, technologies, but also products for different sectors. So I would uh, advise on that point going, uh, all our campuses has a directory of going what our company, what companies are up to. So I would say going, uh, have a look at the campus websites and just find out a little bit more about the great sort of innovation products, which companies are doing from that side. But I think that's a great question. There is, uh, finishing on that point, there are always more questions to be asked and there are always, um, there always more um, solutions could be applied to other sectors at all. So I think it's keep asking questions and keep looking at where the opportunities are. Yeah, absolutely. Such a great note to end on. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Luke, Phil and Alan. This has been a really great talk. It's gone really fast, being split down into three, three distinct parts, which I think is a formula that works really well. Um, I try to tell everybody about the work that we do at STFC and that no two days are the same and that we work at a fast pace to constantly change an environment. And I think this talk has really demonstrated that, uh, but more importantly, how cutting edge and exciting it really is. Uh, so much I didn't even know, and I work there, it's mad. Um, and it's nice at this particular moment in time to hear some good news stories about the science and technology and how it's improving and growing all the time and the things that are happening around us. It makes me feel really proud of the role STFC are, are playing in enabling that um, and what staff like you are actually doing. Uh, I just can't wait to see what the future brings, to be honest with you. So I do hope everybody at home has enjoyed the talk today. Um, but tell us what you think. After this talk has finished, a survey will pop up. And if you could take a few moments to fill that in, we'd be so grateful because we can only do these talks um, if, if, if they're of use to you and, you know, uh, we want to keep them going. Um, and your feedback is very important. Um, all of our talks are on the Darsbury Laboratory social media pages, so head over there to find out more. Uh, today's talk has been recorded, so we can send out um, the link to anybody who's requested it. Um, I'm currently working month to month on the talks, and today, hot off the press, I've just secured Professor Avril MacDonald on the 30th of March, and she will be talking about some of the myths and facts around protect protecting our planet. She's an awesome speaker, so uh, don't miss that one. Uh, if you have any subjects that you're particularly interested in, though, please pop them in the comments on the survey uh, and we'll check them out for you. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank Luke, Phil and Alan once again for delivering today's talk. There's been a lot of information to take in there, but I hope that you will go forth and spread the word about the great things that are happening at, at Darsby Laboratory and SciTech Darsby Campus. Uh, thanks to Phil and Gemma working in the background, as always, really hard, uh, which, which these things can't happen without. And, but most of all, thank you, the public, for joining us tonight. So take care, and I'll be in touch, and I'll see you next time. Thanks very much. <laughs>